Good afternoon and welcome to Understanding Your Cyber Insurance Needs and Keys to Obtaining Coverage, a Health System CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Improvada. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Health System CIO, and I'll be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your questions and comments. You can send them in at any time in the Q&A box, and we'll take them later in the program. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to go about 35, 40 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Brian Kayer, CISO at Keck Medicine of USC, Esmond Kane, CISO at Seward Healthcare, and Dan Borgasano, Vice President with Improvada. And then we will have our Q&A. So big topic, important topic today, and we're going to jump right in. Brian, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Yeah, I am uh, the Chief Information Security Officer for Peck Medicine of USC. So Peck Medicine is a medical system owned by the University of Southern California. So it started about 20 years ago, um, and there, there, there were, were a growing uh, healthcare system. Uh, I've been only in this role for uh, just a little over uh, four months. But I also came previously from another CISO role for another uh, large uh, healthcare system, you know, and a little bit farther background too. I also was in security consulting, where the organization was actually purchased by a insurance brokerage organization, right? So tying in cyber insurance and security consulting was part of that process. So just sharing a little of that background. So some of my Information is not necessarily specific to my current role because it's it's relatively new, but experience in other in other areas. Excellent, Brian. Thank you, Esmond. Uh, hey guys, uh, my name is Esmond uh, Kane. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Stewart Healthcare. Uh, we're in nine states domestically. We're in about three countries internationally. Uh, we have about 38 hospitals currently. Um, you know we're see tens of millions of patients probably on, a, on an annual basis. We, we provide world-class care and we do it in, in very particular locales, a lot of rural and suburban areas. And across nine states, we deal with a lot of different state issues. It's always exciting. COVID has been really hard in the healthcare um, industry as a whole. So thank you for this forum. Uh, thank you for uh, to all my peers. I'm sure we're gonna get lots of interesting questions from the audience. All right, Esmond, thank you. Dan. Thanks, Anthony. Hello, everyone. So as you mentioned, my name is Dan Borgasano. I'm Vice President of Solutions Marketing here at Improvada, uh, which is the digital identity company for healthcare and other mission critical industries. Um, our products are designed to help solve some of your most challenging workflow security and compliance challenges. Um, a lot of you probably know Improvada as the tap and go company, um, providing fast badge tap access into workstations and applications. But I've been here for about 10 years, and in that time, our portfolio has really grown significantly um, to things like identity governance and administration, privileged access management, third-party access management, um, shared mobile devices, patient privacy monitoring, and a number of other things. Um, and we've really seen uh, more and more over the last few years security rise to the top of the priority list for many of our organizations, driven largely in part by changing cybersecurity and insurance requirements. So my role is to really help understand um, what those challenges are and then help um, our teams figure out, you know, how we can best partner with all of you, our customers, um, to help solve them in an efficient and cost-effective way. So thank you for having me and I look forward to the discussion. All right. Excellent, Dan. Thank you. All right, Brian, we're going to start with you. A lot here, uh, a lot on all these questions. How have the processes and requirements around obtaining cyber insurance changed over the past few years? Talk about your most recent experience, either obtaining new coverage or renewing. Any surprises, things you didn't expect? What did they want to see? And did they want to see anything that really surprised you? Yeah, no, uh I have a lot of experience in this uh, realm, um, as I've noted, you know, working in the consulting side, we worked with a lot of clients who started out trying to, you know, understand what their gaps were, you know, needs were, that's what we came in and did some of that consulting and really did what we call risk quantification validation, building that, and that started helping 
drive, what are the things that the cyber insurance carriers need to think about and you know manage through? And then as I pivoted into the healthcare sector, the first the first year we had with cyber insurance that I was there, it was a page and a half questionnaire, maybe 15, 20 questions, simple. Do you have, you know, um, antivirus solution? Yes. Do you have this? You know, a, a very kind of low, uh, simple questions. Do you have a defined security process? You know, um, it really didn't go into deep dive, right? And then the renewal was fairly straightforward because at the time the insurance companies really were kind of starting to build that quantification process around. And then there was that spike. This is all kind of pre-COVID and then COVID, and we saw a really large spike in in those then ransomware attacks going on and, and then everybody going to insurance to basically cover that. And the insurance companies had to come back and say, whoa, we need to, we need to, we need to change course here. We're now losing money in what was a money making area for them. And so they had to, so then that second year when I go for renewal, it was a 200 question process going through and saying, well, now also do a roadshow or, you know, we, all our, you know, previous carriers said, we're not sure if we'll cover you. Basically, we want to go through that process. So we had to go through 26 different carriers to see if we could get insurance. Um, I had to present to them, show our cybersecurity plan, show our capabilities, answer the 200 questions. Uh, lengthy process. A lot of them at the time, also when I would talk to in healthcare, said, "You know, we're not even we're not offering it to anyone in healthcare. We're not offering it to a healthcare organization your size. Uh, no, no, no." And it was actually very challenging. So we eventually were able to get um, two carriers to offer us some options. They split it. Nobody wanted to take the whole piece uh, themselves, and premiums I think went up you know, doubled at that time and the self-insurance requirements skyrocketed. So they call SIR or like, so I, I, in layman's terms, kind of your deductible, right? So your initial deductible may be half a million, a million dollars. And they say, well, we're going to multiply that by 10 times. And so you're going to have a high self-insurance requirement, you know, um, and then coverage, and then they'll, they'll cover after that. So that was our ability to get it in, um, get that insurance the next time. The following year, when we did our, our renewal, which was this past summer, it was actually a little easier. I think what happened is the insurance companies with all the rules that they put in place, had stopped paying a lot of the, <laughs> on a lot of the stuff. So, they, so it changed a little bit of how they actually went through it. And then so the, the process went to maybe instead of 200 questions, I think it was close to 300 questions. So much more detailed ransomware supplements. Let me look at your ransomware itself, doing all those pieces and then, um, you know, managing to, so that was also part of that um, specifically looking at and putting riders on what we're going to do, um, you know, changing some of the, the coverage and how they're going to cover saying, now we're not going to pay for, um, you know, any of the ransomware specifically, or we're going to split it on a 50, 50 basis, right? After the first, maybe $2 million or there, there, there's different stakes. So it changed a lot of what they were able to do uh, and manage for us. Um, so that, that was kind of that, you know, change that second time the, the previous um, our previous insurers decided that they're going to, they're actually going to carry us. So we wouldn't, we didn't have to go back out to market to see if anyone else wanted to, they were actually willing to kind of continue on with us and manage it. But, you know, I, I think that's just that, that change, you, you know, um, the cost had gone up. We've seen, you know, skyrocketing costs in both premium self-insurance requirements, other aspects. Um, after I, you know, focused on what they consider the fundamental um, areas of critical needs that every company has. I think they had like a, a number of 12 critical controls. If you could verify those controls were there, they were actually, they did keep my premiums low when I went for one of the renewals. A lot of the my peers had seen maybe, I guess, in another 100% increase. I only saw a 20% increase and we actually were able to drop that self-insurance requirement because we were showing uh, the the control level that they were happy with. So, um, like I said, those are things I'd seen. The surprises were, like I said, uh, you know, new war clauses, um, 
you know, you know, ransomware supplements, changing how they're going to even pay if you're going to if you end up paying for ransomware, how much they're going to contribute, capping the con contributions, you know, forcing some matching of it. So they they've gotten very creative uh, in in how they approached offering cyber coverage. Wow, Brian, that's incredible. So much there, and we'll definitely follow up on. Yeah. No, no, it's a lot. There's a lot there. I could ask you 17 follow-ups, but I want to spread it around a little bit, and then we'll dig deeper on some of that stuff. So, Esmond, wow, that's. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of what the questions on the screen, or what you heard from Brian? Yeah, it's tough to follow what what Brian just did. It was a very comprehensive answer. Uh, I think you know at a high level. You have to understand that the insurance industry is is reacting to changing circumstances, right? And what we're seeing is a an evolution or an industrialization of cybercrime. And as a result, the, the criteria that insurance are asking of the insured is increasingly evolving. So what you did last year may not necessarily be sufficient to, to obtain insurance this year. You've also, to, to Brian's point, you, you've seen a lot of spreading of risk across the insurance carriers you know they're they're trying to reinsure they're trying to bring other parties in so that uh, on the, the sad fact of life is that they're having to pay out a lot more to brian's point when you look at the payouts associated with merck or Maersk, they were in the billions of dollars uh, of, of range so that, that unfortunately means that the some of the insurance carriers have decided to exit the market it just wasn't a uh, a viable a mechanism for them to, to make money, for lack of a better expression. So they weren't able to provide that safety net to hospitals and providers just because the risk was too high. So we we just went through COVID. So that had a huge impact on, on all of healthcare from an operational and revenue perspective. But what's not well known is, is through that COVID pandemic, there was a, a secondary dual pandemic associated with ransomware. And at this point, um, you're dealing with multiple um, organizations being hit with ransomware on a daily basis to the extent that not only can the insurance industry keep up with it, the firms you're using for incident response retainers can't keep up with the demand. Um, you're looking at, when you look at what's happened recently in beyond healthcare in, in uh, Las Vegas, you know, you had some one casino choosing to pay, you had another that did not. And as a result, one had an immediate billion dollar impact the other one is certainly going to face uh, scrutiny from, from regulators. So from an insurance perspective, that's had a, a knock on effect. How can you insure in these kinds of unprecedented uh, circumstances where not only do we have horrible things happening at a geopolitical level, uh, you've had essentially nation states acting with impunity and the insurers are reacting, right? So recently they've started to add in a nation state or war clauses. If mm -hmm. the threat actor that took you down is, is a nation state, well, that's an act of war. So that may not be covered under your insurance policy. Uh, you've had action certainly at the federal and regulatory level by the SEC and uh, you've had actions in a criminal case against uh, the, the former Uber CISO. Um, where now, indeed, the executive officers are, are being held accountable. There's going to be new rules published for healthcare providers by, in New York soon, again, pushing responsibility to the board of directors. So the insurers are doing their best to stay on top of demand. They're doing their best to provide that safety net for, for providers in, in just unprecedented circumstances. Now, when I think through the other questions, uh, Anthony, that I'm looking at here around surprises or, or things of that nature, for, for me, uh, I do believe that you have to engage with your insurer. So their level of acumen is also having to increase. So it becomes a dialogue. I remember years ago, uh, they would your, the questionnaire that Brian described, they would just say, well, tell us about your strategy with vendor X. And you're sitting there going, well, we don't have vendor X. OK, so if you don't have a solution in that space, they're obviously going to mark you down. That's part of the risk quantification that they will do. But then you have to go through this exercise where you turn around and, OK, I don't have vendor X. I have vendor Y. I'm still addressing the, the, the risk and the level of acumen and the, 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 the collaboration and the kind of repeated inquiries we're having to do with our insurers. To Brian's point, that, that's something that surprised me. They've really stepped up. It's, it's certainly interesting. 
Um, but also, you know, it, it's it's going to change next year. Security is one of those businesses where we can wake up in the morning and learn that something we've been doing for decades was wrong. Hmm. Okay. So how do you as a security professional respond to that? How does the insurance company respond to that? It requires lots and lots of work and requires lots and lots of risk determinations. I mean, I tell my board of directors and I tell my leadership, right, that the goal is not to eliminate risk. That's just not feasible. You have to function. You have to provide services in these unprecedented circumstances. So it's your goal to help manage. But certainly how we're required to manage is, is continually evolving, as is the, the associated insurance requirements. Excellent. Dan, uh, what are you hearing? Uh, you guys work with a ton of health systems. Um, what are you hearing around this this issue? Yeah, so very similar um, things to what uh, Brian and Esmond have just talked about. Um, you know, uh, to, to kind of quantify some of that escalation of attacks that we've seen, you know, I tried to look at some numbers, you know, as we're all experiencing every day, you know, healthcare has seen as much as a 650% uh, increase in ransomware attacks from 21 to 2022. Um, the average cost of a data breach, you know, uh, is $4 million in 2022, but in healthcare specifically, it's more than $10 million. So you know, these are very um, expensive incidents. Um, so we know that, as, as both gentlemen said, their um, cyber insurance companies are responding. Um, we've seen studies that have shown as many as, as much as 27% of insurance claims are not paid due to some sort of policy inclusion. So it's really important to understand all of the different clauses in your policy and you know what could potentially be excluded. We are definitely hearing more and more about the need to have a separate ransomware carve out. That's not necessarily automatically covered in sort of your, your base insurance. Um, you know, and the the sort of the controls you need to have in place we're seeing do go beyond technology. So you need to have things like employee education processes in place, um, you know, incidents response. Um, and other things that really give insurance providers kind of confidence that the organization has done everything they can to to minimize and, as you say, certainly not eliminate, but minimize the, the risk of a breach. Um, what we are hearing about the technology uh, requirements specifically and how they are changing. So, you know, we've seen a lot of these different applications that, that Brian and Esmond talked about. And, you know, I think it was well put that the insurance companies are kind of learning a lot of the different language and, you know, different types of technologies and things at the same time. As a result, a lot of the applications we're seeing are fairly ambiguous and can be interpreted in a couple of different ways in terms of how you might so satisfy that requirement. Um, but one of the areas that we've really seen uh, an increase in terms of requirements is around identity, controlling identities across the, the organization. So, for example, some of the common things that we see are multi-factor authentication for remote network access, but also for on-premises endpoints and applications. Um, better controls over privileged accounts um, and privileged access. Um, vendor access management has, has become a, a topic given all the different attacks we've seen throughout the supply chain um, and on some security vendors themselves. Um, we've seen requirements uh, needing to eliminate the generic use of account or the, the use of generic accounts on shared endpoints. Um, insurance companies want to see that you have controls in place to terminate user access as part of the employee exit uh, process. Um, and then of course, uh, stricter password policies, whether that be longer, more complicated passwords, more frequent um, password rotations, et cetera. So a lot of different changing requirements um, that we're seeing from, from different carriers. And you know, um, while, while at the end of the day, all these are put in place to kind of protect your organization and protect the, the PHI and other data that you have, um, you know, they are changing. And so, you know, I think it's really important to, to kind of stay ahead of your renewal. And, you know, and we'll talk about this later, but um, make sure you're being more proactive about what you need to have in place. So you're not kind of left scrambling with a fire drill when that renewal comes up. Right. Wow. A lot there. Okay. So Brian, I, we did a, a webinar recently and it, it covered uh, auditing and uh, that uh, CISOs and security programs are, you know, a lot of auditing going on from different entities. And they mentioned that sometimes uh, the auditor and the best practice are not lining up. So what the auditor wants to see is really not lining up with the current best practice. 
Well, now we have insurance companies coming in and they're essentially auditing you decide if they're going to give you coverage and whatnot. Have you run into any cases where you're saying you should be doing A, B, C, D, or you need to be doing this this way or that way? And you're saying, well, that's actually not the case. Do you ever wind up at odds with your potential, with your insurance company or potential insurance company to where you're, you're sort of educating them? We, we, it was mentioned by Esmond and you that they're getting far more educated uh, but I, I wonder if you ever run into cases where you're not on the same page about how things should be done. Yeah, there's um, actually a little bit to come what Dan was talking about, the privilege management. So privilege access management, and it really, so of course, I, you know, looking at, you know, what do you have for a privilege access management program, going through those processes, where at the time we were going through a, a different rollout in, in my prior work, uh, of our EMR solution. So we were really changing certain things. And I said, well, you know, looking at kind of, if you want to call, uh, I'll just use the term traditional PAM, right? How do I separate, you know, uh, like the privilege access account? And I told him I was not going to focus necessarily on just putting that program in place because that's not necessarily addressing my highest area of risk. It's that's the identity management, right? Going through the process, understanding the the user identity, putting in those controls that says, what about anomaly detection? What are that process? When you look at when it, when you if you take a look at the cyber attacks, I think it was statistics I seen was eighty percent really target identity, right? Compromised credentials, going through that process. How are we doing that? And really, that was the that was the conversation I had because at one point they were like, "Well, you don't have Pam," and I said, "Well, let's define Pam and let's define the problem." And that's what I said. Let's talk about where the risk is, and let me talk about the controls I put around the management and protection of the identity. You know, anomaly detection, doing that process, and saying, "Hey, you're doing. You've logged into too many computers in a." For a period of time on a force MFA on you, no matter where you're logging in from, on-prem or remote, doing those things, separation and, and just putting that in place for all your critical systems, right? So putting in that process really reduces that lateral spread movement, which is that biggest impact, right? Hey, um, will it is not going to stop necessarily the compromise, but it's going to limit the impact of the compromise. So that was the conversation I like had to go through with them a bit. And that was one of the I would say. One of the areas that uh, educating them on what we were doing and making sure that they understood that pro program that I put in place was more on that risk-based approach and it was actually addressing the significant thing versus somebody who's reading a checkbox list and saying, oh, PAM solution, you know, this, that, this, and just looking at the kind of that traditional things, right? Because things get adapted, right? Um, and then, you know, I know they're going to, you know, things that I know coming up, hey, MFA is, you know, need, we know MFA should be in place, but then it's going to talk about how are we managing or how are you addressing MFA fatigue? Right, those things that, that probably not be part of what they do today, but that's going to be part of the next stage, right? MFA fatigue, where somebody's just going to—they're just so keyed into just accepting the thing, they don't know why or where. They just assume that they're doing that, and then they, you know, authorize, uh, you know, in some cases, a bad actor to, you know, access, right? So those are things I think that I see kind of evolving in the next, and that probably those conversations you'll have with. Uh, you know, the insurance carriers I see in the future as they start to evolve and seeing, yeah, the con traditional controls that we talked to you a year or two or whatever time ago are in place, but now we're seeing changes to those controls or how, how they're being exploited. So let's talk about what are you doing to address? Very good. Esmond, do you do you see that, um, that they're willing to have a dialogue and, and sort of discuss things as opposed to more of a very bureaucratic approach where you can't really explain anything and give any color to to how you're doing something versus what they think they want. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with with what you just heard from from Brian and indeed Dan. You know, there, there's table stakes that they're looking to see, right? Um, but you have to understand that unfortunately some of those table stakes are are very fungible. So you know, if you look at the guidance from CISA, we just went through Cybersecurity Awareness Month, right? So picking a good password to Brian's point around MFA or privileged entity management, updating software, 
uh, having like good access controls and segmentation in place. These are things we've been telling need to be in place for, for several decades. And HIPAA requires it, and NIST, you know, PCI, all these various other regulations re require it. Uh, but now the discussion with the carriers are, and the, the cyber insurers is around, okay, well, tell us about your strategy. Let, let's take a, a term which is overly abused in, in marketing terms like zero trust. Zero trust will mean different things to different people. Brian's already described around privileged access management can mean different things. Um, but zero trust is another one. You know, for, for some organizations, it, it's very network driven. For others, it's very identity driven. Uh, others maybe have a more holistic program. Maybe they're aligning with like some of the NIST 800 uh, uh, kind of frameworks. So, you know, that requires a, a back and forth in an education to find out, well, uh, you know, Mr. Insurance or Miss Insurance, what are you trying to accomplish? Tell me what you're really asking here, and I'll tell you what our strategy is. So th this really falls back on another traditional control that you should have, which is you should be continually assessing your organization for risk. You should be continually modeling those threats that you face. So when it comes to that due diligence, whether it's an auditor, or you're going through a SOC, or you're, you're, get, you're getting ready for cyber insurance, you, you know, you're just tapping into documentation you already have on tap. You may be presenting it to your board on occasion. You may be presented it to your various committees. So hopefully what you're trying to accomplish here is demonstrating that maturity, that you're already looking at these spaces. You're definitely being tactical. You need to have those protective controls in play, which are status quo. Those are table stakes. But you also are thinking ahead on the, on the, the continuum of attacks to... To Brian's point, you're looking at fisher-proof protection. You know, to, to Dan's point, you're, you're looking at kind of biometric or the next generation of authentication because the bad guys can SIM swap and steal SMS messages or, uh, you know, they can clone certain classes of badges or things of that nature. You're you're kind of investing strategically in your program so that you're, you're, you're defining a roadmap, that you're putting that in front of the right leadership. But the, 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 like a year ago, no cyber insurer would have asked you a question on AI, right? Mm -hmm. You better believe it's going to be in everyone's next cyber insurance questionnaire. You know, you know you, they, they just got around to talking around things like uh, immutable backups or, uh, you, you know, advanced endpoint protection, EDR, or, or you know, overcoming the, the, the concept of just-in-time privilege and, and what it means to do standing privilege or you know, also embracing the cloud. So you know, a, a lot of those insurers were kind of already evolving to your point, they, they were stepping up. And, and hopefully what you're able to do is when you're having that dialogue with them, uh, you're able to communicate the fact that, yeah, here's what we're thinking in that space. And here's what it looks like for the next few years. So it is an open dialogue and you may end up with some kind of uh, homework. You may need to go back and say, okay, well, we need to move this program forward or, uh, you know, we need to start making investments in, in this this space, um, you know, the bad guys are going to wait for you. You know, if if you're going to somehow wait for the cyber insurers to dictate your security strategy, you're perhaps not paying attention to the very real world threats that are happening daily. That's a, that's a great point. And then, it, you know, it makes you think it's, a, it's another reason to stay on top of things. Um, and Esmond touched on the point of either being reactive to your cyber insurance carrier's requests, which is probably not optimal, right? Because they may not give you time to put something into place. So, or or sort of anticipating, and that may be tricky too, because there could be five, six things you could work on, and you say, well, I wonder what my cyber insurance carrier might come up with next time around. So, it, it can affect your strategy or inform your thinking it's not something you can discount if you need cyber insurance which i think everybody does and we could talk about that more but dan what are your thoughts yeah so you know i think um the ability to obtain cyber insurance or keep your premiums down or have high confidence that a claim would be paid out should really all just be results of uh and benefits of a sound strategy to begin with, right? To, to, to Esmond's point, not the other way around. Um, so if you have that sort of security by design philosophy and have those robust controls in place, you know, which ultimately will re result in a reduction of risk, 
um, that then again, you know, the cyber insurance requirements should be, you know, just kind of a, a byproduct, a benefit uh, of that. Um, unfortunately, though, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, budgets are tight, resources are constrained in a lot of ways. There's a lot of priorities, you know, competing priorities. Um, you know, security does tend to be one that, that has high, high priority, but even then, as we talked about earlier, it's hard to, to keep pace with the bad actors. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, while everyone would like to be proactive in their strategy um, and not have to worry about these changing requirements because they're already ahead of the game, resources and budget sometimes just, just don't really uh, allow for that. Um, you know, which is why I would say in our case, like we try to really partner with our clients as a, as a vendor um, to, you know, automate as much as we can or help them prioritize or, you know, talk about different alternatives to accomplish the same goal, um, something that is more feasible for their, their budget or their timelines or their, um, you know, staffing um, resource constraints that they may have. Very good, Brian. Um, so what I was thinking, uh, you know, as you were talking about the complexity of these, of these policies and how there are many different spots in a policy that they are adjusting, that they are trying to reduce their risk, right? And put the risk on you, right? That's what it's all about. Who's right. who's going to own the risk? They want to push as much to you as possible. Right. You want to push as much to them. So your CISOs, you guys are really good at understanding your jobs. You, you're good at understanding lots of stuff. These can be, I'm guessing these can be phenomenally complex documents. Okay, I don't know if every CISO is good at figuring out the value of a policy. If this is a good policy or a bad policy, what do, how much risk has been pushed on us? Do I understand all these little levers and knobs and what they mean? So my question to you is, is that something you're expected to understand and sort of take a stand on for your organization? Meaning, Brian Kayer, I'm going to explain this policy to the board and tell you guys if this is good or bad, if it's worth the cost. Or is it common practice that it's that CISOs are bringing in experts? Not experts inside, but so, I guess they have to know something. My point is, how the heck do you figure out if you're getting a good deal? Good questions. So I don't know. Um, I think that there is probably some expectation that the CISO knows all those things, right? Because obviously we're there to understand our cyber risk and nobody understands that or the, the other than the, the CISO, right? So that's that piece. They're going to look and say, you know the risk. You know what we have. Should we be paying this amount? Where, you know, what what's that value? Um, I think part of it too, so going into the semantics of the contract itself, hopefully you have a you know, a good risk management team that has that experience and in, in the, the depth to go through that and saying, let's look at all the key things. But to me, I always go back and saying, I want to probably put a program in where I don't need to use insurance, right? That's the, that's the focus. So I always look and saying, well, what's that cost for them to do this versus what's our cost of implementing your control to avoid the problem in the first place? And those are the things I'm going to try to drive to the change and to the, you know, in, in that decision. So Spend the money here because you're going to spend it elsewhere. If you don't, hey, build this control, build this capability. If not, you're going to pay for it in a premium. And good luck trying to actually claim on that because you're going to now, when you go through that process, you're going to have to go through all these steps. Okay, you know, what's my claim rate? What's my sub? How much did I, what was my actual impact? How did I validate my impact? What was my true business loss? There's so much things that go in there where insurance carriers obviously don't, nobody wants to pay that unless it's, you know, needed. And so to me, I always go back and try to bring this, you know, what fundamentally are they trying to have us do? Build a better security program. So let's focus on building the good, strong program and not always relying on, you know, the insurance. We all need it. I think it's that piece. I would want to know I have it, but I don't ever want to use it. Right. And that's the kind of the, that's that that was the message I always shared out to try to drive the change forward. Excellent. Esmond, um, what are your thoughts on that issue? I mean, you know, with a very large organization, these policies must be 
like a phone book getting dropped on your desk. <laughs> it, it, I mean, I would, I would imagine there's people that specialize just in figuring out if, if a policy makes sense. I can't even figure out when I, when I go get a used car or when I'm leasing a car, I can't figure that out. They could be taking me for a ride, so to speak, every time. So this is multiply that by a hundred million. So cyber insurance is just one dimension of your enterprise risk management, right? So in hospitals, we have clinical, we've got malpractice. Uh, other organizations might have uh, similar ones, or indeed there's financial risk, there's operational risk. There, there's various other classes of risk. And typically it does fall to someone who's managing your, your program. And the, the person who's managing the, those various classes of risk management and insurance efforts will just work with the parties internally that, that things have been delegated to. They're not really expected to be a subject matter expert in all the things that they're trying to negotiate on. And to, to your point, the the things that you're insuring against, you know, they will vary by the different policies and the various things that you're asking to include in that policy. Um, so it, it does require a dedicated person uh, or team if you're a relatively complex or mature organization, it's certainly worthwhile. But I think, Anthony, uh, I just want to kind of refute the necessity for that process to be contentious. Um, you know, cyber insurance is, is hopefully benefiting the organization, right? It's it's a risk mitigation measure. It's something that that's, uh, CISOs can use to talk about what we have to do. Uh, yes, it can be overly prescriptive, but it also can be used to educate Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody else is doing this. Why can't we? Where we'll require it to do it now. So you can stay on top of those kinds of updates. When you look at, as I mentioned before, the continuous evolving landscape, uh, from a regulatory and a liability perspective, there's also elements of that that you need to counter, right? CISOs are operating under heightened liability right now. The SEC's expectations have increased. Uh, and indeed, uh, you're looking at the kind of class actions and things where CISOs are being held a lot more accountable. So, you know, starting to include things around uh, insurance, personal insurance or in our retainer or things like that, typically you have only seen for maybe your CFO. We're certainly starting to have that conversation around CISOs. Um, but but to your point, it's it takes work and anything that, that wants to, to have a high product or a quality product typically means you, you should have somebody dedicated to it and that they should be, uh, to your point as well, maybe socializing and talking about it with their peers, because it's not like insurance is unique to your organization. Everybody's mm -hmm. going through the same thing, as are the insurers. Make it a dialogue, talk with your peers, make sure that you have continual conversations with your insurers. Uh, to Brian's point from earlier, um, it's not just questionnaires anymore. You, you might be doing presentations, if not more than one. Um, you know, there's also a global aspect to this. Um, you may be talking to parties that are not just U.S. based. So you're also dealing with like international risk as well there. So anyway, you look at it, it's a spectrum. It's not simple. I highly encourage organizations to invest in the process, but I wouldn't necessarily view it as, as a negative or a necessary evil. It's something that should be part of your discussions with your leadership. It should be part of your risk management program because you can drive progress if you're required to do certain things. And that can overcome some of the obstacles or financial challenges that Dan brought up earlier. If you turn around and say, well, you know, we're required to do this or cyber insurer needs us to do this. Well, all of a sudden the conversation becomes not, it's, this is not a need to have, this is a must have. And it becomes a when, not an if. That's a good point, Esmond. I, I have a very adversarial picture in my head and it probably doesn't, doesn't have to be that way. And hopefully isn't that way, Dan? Anything you want to weigh in on that you've heard? Yeah, I mean, you know, to your question earlier about sort of understanding the complexities, um, one of the other interesting things that we've seen as a result of this, you know, skyrocketing of cyber insurance requirements and costs is um, legal firms starting to have specialization in cyber insurance. And we have, we know, we have customers that have legal firms and attorneys on retainer who specialize just in these cyber best practices, part of which is to help them understand hmm. not only their policies and their requirements, but to help them implement best practices for staying ahead of the requirements and maybe more importantly, or, or more especially in that case, how to deal with an incident and how to hmm. prepare for 
submitting a claim mm -hmm. and all the things that are going to have to happen um, if that's the case. So, you know, in the case of the inability to have sort of internal resources dedicated to this, as Esmond is talking about, there are legal firms that do offer services. Again, it's, a, it's an additional cost, um, but we have seen some of our customers go that route. So again, they, they, they not only understand what's required of them from the policy, but really how to manage through an incident um, and deal with insurance and make sure they're able to demonstrate they didn't have, in fact, all these controls in place. They're responding in the required amount of timelines. They're going through the correct processes, uh, et cetera. But there's, there's certainly a legal element uh, aspect to this as well. Dan, I wonder if do they uh, do you think they possibly pro these legal firms provide assistance to maybe health systems in the purchasing of the insurance to act almost as their agent and representative? So from what I've seen, they do uh, in many cases partner with a lot of these firms, you know, because they because they um, have seen a lot of different policies and therefore are familiar with the insurance providers, they may guide their clients one way or the other. Um, and then they uh, develop relationships with those providers, which I think at the end is ultimately beneficial because, you know, if the attorney is sort of acting on good faith um, of the client, mm -hmm. then back to, you know, what we were talking about earlier about kind of creating that dialogue, um, that ongoing dialogue about what, what, you know, on paper may seem like it's comprehensive or even feasible in reality and in, in practice may not be. So making sure those things are kind of continually evolving. So, you know, I do think that in many ways, they're not only just the recommendations, but, you know, that sort of buffer can help um, guide the view of the insurance providers as well. Do we know if there are any health systems out there that have been unable? Do we assume, do we know? Let's take a guess. Are, are there scenarios out there where people have not been able to get insurance and have had to figure out how to operate without it? Or I don't know. I mean, we talked about some of these scenarios. We know there's very few left. There are some cases with large health systems where there may be two people offering you a quote. I guess you could have a scenario where, no, we're not renewing you. Good luck. We can't get anybody else. Do we think that's actually happening? I know we're conjecture, but Brian, do you suppose anybody out there can't get insurance? Is it conceivable to operate without insurance as a health system? So I know I've chatted with peers in the in the industry and heard some of them having challenges with getting insurance and that they were looking at opportunities or options about, you know, potential just like self-insurance coverage. What are they going to do? Um, I can't imagine if where when I look at the control stuff that the the controls that were required based on some, you know, th that they were asking us to put in place and have in place, the smaller health organizations probably having challenges meeting those demands just from budget, resources, experience, getting that process going. So if they're going to, uh, and so I don't know if the carriers were holding into that same level of scrutiny. If they were, they probably weren't getting insurance. So they're going to look at it. Could you go without insurance? Yes, but you're playing it just like anything. It's it's you're playing a big risk game, right? Mm -hmm. If you have an impact, could you sustain that, right? As as Dan noted, in in you know, an average cost of a healthcare breach in 2022 is over 10 million dollars. So, if do you have 10 million dollars aside to su support that? Um, so that that's that big question, and and so that's where the insurance, you know, having that. Um, Called safety net helps, right? You know, continue to operate because that's going to come out of your operating expense and and probably have a significant impact in your organization if you don't. So, um, I believe you know I, I believe there are probably some that have not had foregone it because a they just didn't have the nobody even even based on premium nobody was going to offer it to them. Hey, Esmond, uh, do you, I don't even know if this is a silly question. Is the paying of a ransom included in the insurance so for example is that part of the deal um i just did an interview with uh someone from the fbi that i didn't publish yet i did that this morning um they certainly don't encourage payment of ransoms but they're not going to stop you unless it's to uh some entity that's been sanctioned 
Uh, but otherwise, they're not going to stop you. They don't want you to do it. They don't encourage it. They don't think it's a good idea, but they will not stop you. Um, in fact, they won't even leave. I said, if you're involved in an incident, you're helping an organization going through ransomware, and they say, well, we're going to pay. I said, do you guys like pack your suitcase and walk out? No, they don't do that, uh, which is kind of a good thing. You know, they're not going to sort of leave you high and dry there. Question to you is, do you know if that's part of the insurance arrangement, the insurance company is going to take on all or some of that payment, or is that not on the table with this stuff? I, I'd be speculating if I said that it was included. Uh, so, so I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I do. I will state that when it comes to a, a major operational impact like ransomware, you do get very creative. Uh, I certainly would hope that no one would pay uh, the, these criminals. Uh, you're you're not necessarily going to get value on your payment, right? It's it, it's not like these people specialize in restoring your operations. They're they're going to give you a crappy tool that may or may not work. And, you know, you're almost certainly inviting them to come back and attack you again because you've proven to be a, a right target. And, but again, the ransomware actors are also getting creative. You know, they're getting into like double extortion and triple extortion. So, you know, I certainly wouldn't encourage anyone to, to pay a ransom. I wouldn't encourage it to be part of your insurance package. Um, I will estimate that, when you look at what the casinos did recently in Vegas, it's probably um, seen by some executives as being the, the path of least resistance. Uh, but you're you're potentially paying terrorists. You're potentially mm -hmm. opening yourself up to uh, all kinds of allegations from the federal government. Right? Um, it, it's just borderline unethical, if not outright, uh, you know, unethical. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't counter, encourage it. Um, I, I certainly don't think that it's going to do anything but just kick the can down the road. Um, I think there's to the, the point that Dan and, and Brian brought up earlier. If if that's even on your radar, you should be having a conversation about what else you can do with that money. Uh, you know how you can protect yourself. Mm -hmm. um, the, the point came up earlier. It's it's not just. Uh, meeting a perceived hygiene level it's, it's been able to also pass an audit so you know again these are conversations that you should be having if you're looking at insurance as, as kind of a, a carte blanche or a get out of jail card um, there very well may be very real jail consequences for paying a, a ransom in the very near future right yeah it could change they could yeah. make that a yeah so I I think self-defeating, if that's even on your radar to talk about, and I, I, I think that's not necessarily what insurance is designed to to promote. Uh, in healthcare, it's all about patient safety, and if you're establishing some sort of cozy relationship with criminals, that's that's failing at your first uh, initiative, right? That is not the, the first do no harm effort. Um, so I think there's other ways and perhaps other careers you should be looking at if that's even on your radar. Dan, were you going to jump in and say something? Well, yeah, so we actually have heard from our customers and even some of the insurance providers that rent a ransomware uh, policy is, in, in many cases, completely separate. Your standard cyber insurance policy will not cover you for ransomware specifically. And, you know, a lot of that maybe has to do with, with what you're talking about, Esmond. It maybe discourages the payment of that ransom. But, um, you know, if that is the... Is it, if that is a threat that you're looking at and there's a reason you're looking at uh, cyber insurance, you wanna make sure that you do have that carve out if it's required. And then back to your question about operating without insurance. Um, you know, in many cases, what we've heard uh, from customers, bigger customers, uh, bigger organizations is, you know, many are choosing to, to self-insure and it's, it's a calculated risk, um, but they look at their, their deductible equivalent mm -hmm. of their deductible plus the the cost of the insurance itself on top of the cost of that you know that mm -hmm. that ransomware clause and you know they kind of look at it and say hey we could be investing more in our tools and people and best practices and maybe take the calculated risk that what we're doing is 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 enough to keep the the, the risk to a minimum um but yeah we've definitely seen and heard that that 
generally speaking, ransomware is is outside of uh, the coverage of sort of your your typical cyber insurance policy. Yeah, and then and then bro, and then Dan, it's like, so it's 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 carve out separate policy, but then even with the carve out is a is a payment of ransom in that policy or is it just all around ransomware so that's why you know what yeah, I'm some, curious sometimes about. yes sometimes no you know i mean it's a good point there are a lot of other you know the incident of ransomware attack right there's other factors to consider right there's that opportunity cost of lost revenue if things yeah. you know during downtime there's all the legal fees potential hip fines and you know, damage to reputation and impact to patient care, as Esmond alluded to, and, you know, didn't even occur to me, but it's a great point, Esmond, that maybe even longer term ramifications for not only the organization, but potentially you individually, right? So, you know, some of those things we've seen are included in, in various policies, some are not. So really important to evaluate, to look at these things closely and then sort of weigh all the factors and what, you know, level of risk you're, you're kind of willing to, to take. You know, Brian, nobody wants to pay. You know, I understand what Esmond's saying, and I agree. It makes perfect sense. Nobody wants to pay, but they're paying. We're seeing, we know that, right? We know that not an inco- inconsequential percentage of organizations that have been, uh, you know, attacked with ransomware have decided to pay. So I wonder if that's, uh, and you don't know, I'm not asking for the details of the conversation, but I would imagine that's probably conversations that CISOs should have with the executive team and the board when you're doing tabletops and disaster recovery ransomware exercises. Those should be conversations you don't have for the first time when it happens. Correct. So that that is a true is test, you know, validation of some of that stuff up front. So you're having those answers. Um, on that question you, you noted about kind of that, you know, paying and not paying. I mean, it obviously it depends. I think a couple of years ago too is, hey, everybody said, well, we have coverage. Let's just pay the ransom and see how it goes. Maybe they're not going to give us the keys and maybe we could decrypt some of this stuff, help us recover a little bit quicker. So they, and they had the insurance ca- coverage to do that. So they used it. And then now they, but the thing is the insurance carriers got a little more, uh, smarter to that, you know, demand and saying, hey, we're going to, we're not just going to be there. So again, hey, if it's a ransomware demand, we're not going to pay for the first $2 million of that ransomware, ransom demand, and anything above that up to a cap, and they'll cap it too, you know, that you pay 50% of it. So Mm -hmm. then it makes a big decision back to the business and saying, okay, do we pay or not pay? Because it's easy to win. It's easy to pay when it's somebody else's money. Sure, sure. <laughs> and that was what was happening. Yeah. I think you were seeing that. They're like, if it's not my money and it's coming from the insurance, let me do it. But now I have to make a decision because it's going to come from my pocket. I'm going to see, you know, the, the, the big question comes back, could we recover? How quickly can we recover, right? Do we have the backups? Do we have the process? Are we able to recover? If those answers are yes, then the, the, then the demand of paying it is no. I'm going to bet you, I bet you that these ransom people have said, send faxes, faxes, send us your cyber insurance policy. We want to see, we want to take a look at it. Then that's going to help them figure out how much they're going to try and get out of you because they'll know that, you know, they'll read it and they'll go, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're not going to be on the hook for everything. So anyway, that's just my theory. No, uh, I, I heard from a case. So I'm not just a quickly. Uh, yeah. I heard from not not related to any. You know, it was a, a somebody in the industry I knew he, he talked about that. You know, they had worked on a um, a client case, and the ransomware attackers actually had had a copy of, of their policy. Sure. So they were negotiating. And they was like, no, no, no. We know exactly what your policy Absolutely. says. They actually, they actually stole it. Um, Absolutely. They're not dumb. Uh, they're not nice, but they're not dumb. Um, we have time for a, a round of final thoughts. Uh, best piece of advice, you know, cyber insurance, cybersecurity, wherever you want to go, best piece of advice on everything we've talked about today for your colleagues out there. Um, Esmond, let's start with you. Uh, I'll go back to a point I made earlier, Anthony. Um and and by the way, I thought there was just such great guidance throughout this whole thing from from Brian and Dan. So so thank you guys. But for me, it's it's a continuum. It's it's uh, 
it's it's a continual effort where you're investing. Cyber insurance is just one among the, the different weapons that are in your existing arsenal. If you're only thinking about it once a year, then you're you're not taking advantage of what it can bring to bear. You need to be preparing for cyber insurance all the time. But again, it's a subset of your larger risk management program. And you know, it should dovetail into that. You should be investing, you should be communicating, you should be continually educating. And, uh, you know, again, hopefully you're working with subject matter experts that are internal or external to Dan's point, uh, <laughs> but you're, you're benefiting from the the weapon that this brings you, to, uh, brings to the table so that you can continue to improve your program, overcome some of your obstacles. Excellent. Brian? Focus on security fundamentals, because that's where everybody stops. They forget about doing the, the basics. Make sure you have all those in place and then continuously improve. Don't stop improving. Excellent. Dan, we'll give you the last thought. Sure. So, and to so touch on, you know, so that's something I alluded to earlier, but, you know, try to be as proactive as possible um, about understanding if we're talking specifically about your cyber insurance requirements. Um, and as far advanced as you can, uh, as far advanced as renewal as possible. You know, you don't want to be left kind of scrambling to identify, evaluate, select, procure, test, and then implement a solution um, um, ahead of, of some renewal date. Um, it, will, it will not only disrupt your teams, of course, possibly your end users, but may create kind of budget, budgetary issues and strains. Um, and, you know, staying ahead of that will also allow you to select solutions and processes and technologies that are gonna best fit your, your longer term strategy, right? You don't wanna be left with kind of a stopgap that may check a box, but in the end doesn't really fit into your long-term strategy. And now you've got um, you know, a bigger headache on your hands longer term. So, so be proactive, that way you can be very thoughtful uh, about the, the, you know, the, the different products and, and um, processes you put in place. Excellent. Uh, regarding continuing education, you can use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording is ready for viewing. If you want to work with us, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team and go to our website to register for upcoming panels. With that, I want to thank our tremendous panel. I told you guys it would go by in a blink of an eye, and it did. Uh, Brian Kayer, Esmond Kane, Dan Borgasano, Improvada for sponsoring and making this event possible, and you for attending. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.